Hey everybody, this is uh, Alex and Ilya from NIR, and we're here with Anatoly from Solana to do a super deep dive and discuss really intense details about their protocol. Anatoly, you want to give a short intro about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, um, I'm Anatoly. Um, uh, I'm the founder CEO of Solana. Solana is a very high performance blockchain. Um, that does no sharding opposite of near. So um, <laughs> I'd love to argue with these guys about technology. All right, uh, let's start with kind of, you describe us a uh, high level and then we'll go really deep. Sure, so at a very high level, um, Solana is based around this idea that you can use a clock, um, a global clock, to speed up a distributed system. And the city has been around for like a really long time, since you know the 40s. Um, and our clock is permissionless. So what's interesting about our clock is that it actually works before consensus. Like before you actually have any notion of an agreement in the system, you still have a, a notion of time. And that's why we can actually leverage that to speed up the network. So that's kind of like the, the very shallow deep dive. Um, the int so how, how does our clock work? So I think if you guys have been following the space in the last year, there's been kind of this explosion of ideas around verifiable delay functions or VDS. Um, I actually didn't, didn't know anything about VDS when I came up with this. I just had too much coffee <laughs> and, I, and I was up until four in the morning. <laughs> uh, and our clock is a, maybe the simplest way you can implement a VDS. So imagine you have a, a SHA-256, any cryptographic pre image resistant hash functions would work. And this thing just loops over itself, right? So it keeps going and going and going. Um, and every you know, X amount of iterations, you just take a sample. Um, so when I mean loops over itself, its output is the next input. Just recursively just runs. Um, because it's pre image resistant, um, you can't predict any of the values that are going to occur you know, like 100 million iterations from now. You actually have to run this thing in a single core, single process um, without stopping. So, you know, let's say this is like, you know, 1 million iterations and the value is like 0, B, I, A, whatever, right? This is 2 million, the value is like 0, C, D, F, dot, dot. And it just keeps going forever. So these samples represent a data structure that tells you that somebody somewhere spent real time building it. Um, so what's interesting about this data structure is you can uh, encode messages into it. So I can simply take a message or a big blob of data and hash it and then kind of stick it in here before we do this iteration. So now I have some value here, right? some, some bytes bits that I've inserted here. Um, so now at this point, all the subsequent hashes have been modified in an unpredictable way because it's pre image resistant. Um, so what also is interesting is if this thing itself also contained a reference to some other value that it observed. So now this guarantees that this message was created after this point and before this point. So now we have this data structure, right, that encodes uh, time, but also an order of events and the relative order between them, as well as the, the relative amount of time between them. Right? So we call this thing proof of history because it gives you a proof of a historical record. Um, so now imagine you have this data structure that I sent to you guys, you know, with a, like a thumb drive attached to a carrier pigeon, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you're looking at this data structure, right? And this is like the head pointer. This is the last, the last thing you see. And somewhere here you see a network message. Somewhere here you see a network message. Somewhere here you see like network messages, right? So given this last thing that you've observed, you can compute whatever algorithm you choose the active step set of the network, right? What's the set of the network? The, the, whatever algorithm you choose, you could say that somebody had to have sent a, like a message once over the last two weeks, right? Yeah, makes sense. Whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. You pick some algorithm, right? Um, but the point is that at this point, this point in the in the ledger, right? At this point in history, 
which is identified by the count, right? You know, one billion and some value, zero X, blah, 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 F E. Um, you've decided that this is the state of the network. So what's interesting is that everyone else observing this data structure using the same algorithm will decide the exact same state of the network. And if we optimistically assume that everybody's looking at this thing, then this is how we cheat the two generals problem, right? If everybody optimistically assumes that they're looking at this thing, they construct a message that references this value that's only valid if it appears sometime later, right? Um, and we say we attack, right? Everybody attacks. <laughs> <laughs> and if we're lucky and everyone did actually observe the same thing, we will see that as evidence here by a bunch of messages to indicate the attack, which is concluded from the exact same information that, everybody, that everyone observed. So that's fundamentally how our, our system works, is that based on this historical record, which is now cryptographic, it's not just you know, timestamps that I etched in, the, you know, in bits right, and made up. Um, we can actually come to agreement about the state of the network and therefore make a decision and that decision is consistent along with everyone else, optimistically. Right. And so you're saying we're cheating to generals program. Yeah. Problem. Uh, you, so you're saying that Solana would uh, survive even if you have more than one third of malicious actors? Um, so you can't, like, there's no solution to the two generals problem, okay. right? You can only cheat it. <laughs> right. But, but, but uh, do you think that with this cheat, it would be? Uh, save even if there's like, let's say, 40% of well, malicious actors. It doesn't matter how many malicious actors are because the way you win the two generals problem is I don't say oh, two it. Generals uh, problem. Sorry, I'm thinking of a... The n generals problem. Yeah. doesn't matter. The way, the way we actually solve it is when we look at this point here, we say that we solved it here. Mm. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, whatever, one hour later we decide, oh yeah, we did actually solve it and here's the proof. Right, because the system then has evidence that it has, did come to agreement here and it has multiple confirmations. And our system, just like proof of work, um, the deeper this event occurs, the harder it is to unroll. Yeah. So we, I can kind of like dive into that. So you may have like a bunch of forks, but presumably like one hour later, they will yeah, resolve they all one way or another. Yeah, yeah. But so let's say hypothetically, the, the person who runs the, the proof of history is malicious. And he has two cores, let's say. Yeah. And so he has a second core where he computes the same thing, but he misses one message. Yeah, so um, that's fine. So we can kind of get into the consensus part if you guys want. So, so, this part, okay, so this part is orthogonal to consensus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a way for us to have evidence that the message happened. Yeah, because yeah. once, you once you observe the structure, you don't really care how it was generated whether it was multiple leaders, two leaders, one, doesn't matter, right? Kind of the data, the, everything about the network is derived from the data itself. So right. there's no weak subjectivity. And so I, I, as a person who received this thumb drive, how do I verify that all the hashes were computed correctly? Uh, so that's where you take your GPU card that you buy at Fry's. <laughs> you look at each slice in between here, right? And then you use one core on every slice so in about 4,000 slices you can verify it in, in one loop. So one second can be verified in about a quarter millisecond. Okay, so with one GPU, we will be verifying 4,000 times, 4, times faster. Yeah. So if the, but if four, with four GPUs, you're 16,000 times faster. Um, kind of like if you look at your, your like entry level Ethereum mining rig has like 12 GPUs in there. Right? <laughs> and then for, this, for safety, so let, let's say I'm, I'm planning to run a some sort of exchange, and I need to be absolutely certain, you know, there's nothing weird happening. I need to verify everything from the Genesis block. Um, depends, depends. That's like a, right. that, that is a complicated <laughs> thing. But that, still, that's a complicated question. <laughs> if it's been four years since the Genesis block, I will verify it in one third of a day, right? Um, depends on your GPU capacity okay, it's because it's completely yeah, it's for parallelizable, right? That, that sounds reasonable. That's about right. how much time it takes to, to sync to Ethereum anyway. <laughs> but in one hour, you could spin up, you know, a hundred GPUs on Google yeah. Cloud and verify everything. Yeah, right? makes sense. But so for verifying, you still need to have the checkpoint it's relative frequently. So how big is that data structure? Um, we are generating maybe at most two thousand per second. 
And that's simply because, so our kind of target is one gigabit. Um, UDP packets are 64 kilobytes. You can generate 2,000 of them per second. Oh, 2,000 uh, checkpoint so hashes. Yeah. Yeah. So hashes or checkpoints? It's the same thing. Oh, yes, yeah. hashes. Because every time you encode the message, um, which is like a data packet, you need to record the, the state and the counter. Yeah, well, but how many hashes does a single core compute per second? Oh, for, uh, about 3 million, I think. 3 million hashes? Yeah. It might be more now. There's a, uh, we haven't measured it, but like AMD's Threadripper has SHA-256 specific instructions. Right. Um, and so, uh, Justin Drake is very into VDS these days, right? Yeah. So they want to build this ASIC that will be computing some other VDF, not this one. Yeah, so, right. so our VDF is extremely simple. Um, it doesn't do anything fancy. What they're doing is something that, given like, let's say, 10 seconds worth of data, the verification time is maybe constant or fast, like polynomial. Yeah. Like, so the, the difference there is that ours grows linearly. You know, verification time is linear to the CPU time necessary to, to verify. But CPUs double in cores every two years. So I think by the time they ship V, v zero of their hardware, we would be like at 8,000 cores, right, per GPU card. Yeah. <laughs> But then I think, unless I'm missing, unless I remember it wrong, Justin mentioned in one of the podcasts that Solana wants to participate yes. with them. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what, what's your interest if you're using a different VDF? Why wouldn't we swap it for something that's uh, algorithmically better? Like we, we're we're not like we don't care, right? You're yeah, sure. you're a specific function. <laughs> we're, it makes sense. Yeah. But what you would need. But the properties you want from VDF are very different from what they want, right? You want it to be. You know, you, you want the VDF to be producing values 2,000 times per second. Well, um, their use cases like... Our, our main, like, problem with the... The stuff is still in research. Is like, they're using snarks and starks. And so the complicated things there is uh, setup. So their approach, um, maybe use a large MPC group, but it's like a, effectively like a snark style setup. Yeah, you either need a trusted group, so you need to make it huge, or you need some other mechanism to create like kind of the initial seed such that you know that this wasn't pre-computed before. Oh, yeah. For us, because we're using SHA-256, it's very, very dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, uh, to somebody that's been working on operating systems, it's very transparent what it does. Um, their setup requires this like kind of like, you know, magic ceremony. Right? <laughs> well, that's as they use a snark setup, yeah. Yeah. They do, presumably snarks now, you can, I think they use neither. They they just they just computing some arithmetic operation. Uh, the, their operation like, requires a setup right now. They, they need a semi prime, right? Yeah. 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 So, so they need a semi prime, which is. Well, yeah, they're using a prime version of the, like the hash function they use is uh, like Peterson. Well, I'm speculating here, but if, if you're assuming Peterson commitment hash function and you compute it yeah. many times, you can compute a snark of that very easily. Yeah, proves that yeah. you've done this computation this many times. Sure. So, so, you so do that, that's, well. that's the one part that's complicated. Um, the other part is uh, what we're doing is biasing the input. Every time you have a message in the network, we stick it into the into this loop, right? Mm -hmm. The frequency of that we can we can make it work with whatever function they do, but our main concern here is a security concern: is if you can bias this input. Um, you can potentially generate a hash function if the if this is not pre-image secure, right? If this is not pre-image resistant, when you do this message recording, um, we want this part to be guaranteed to uh, be secure, such that you can't like generate a loop. Yeah. Um, I think. Well, I've t I've talked to Justin. He feels confident that we can get our stuff working with theirs. Um, I trust his opinion, <laughs> I'm, I'm, and I'm happy to switch. Yeah, that, <laughs> awesome. that's not a problem. Cool. So, yeah. Okay, so let's say okay. let's say we have the clock. Okay. What do we do next? Okay, so the main part about why things can be fast with a clock, right, is because when you do this active set computation, um, you're doing this without messaging anyone, right? You got this data structure from a carrier pigeon with a thumb drive. You don't have to talk to anyone else in the network. You actually do this computation locally. Um, and that's the speed up, right? Because now there's no, there's no interactive th thing that you have to do with anyone else. 
simply optimistically guess that I've downloaded the right structure, right, and I'm going to send it. So why the, the, that should kind of intuitively tell you why it's fast, right? Um, sort of. So <laughs> um, the second part of why we can leverage this is uses that point is because in our setup, we have a single leader at a time um, and a bunch of validators that are receiving this data. So validators don't care how they get this data, right? Because they're deriving everything from the data directly. So this leader can broadcast you know, one over n validators worth of data to each one, and then they exchange it. Um, so that is effectively BitTorrent. And you can scale this out to a log you know, tree structure. Mm -hmm. Right, so the fan out of the, whatever your fan out is, um, we verified this somewhere about 200. That means that in the second layer, you have about 40,000 nodes. So with only two hops. So our finality grows with the log of the network size. Yeah. And this fan out can be pretty huge. Is this topology like set or it changes um, it, all the time? It, it changes all the time. Yeah, there's no like, um, how, how you get placed is stake based, so based on your stake. But effectively, you know, we try to get this group to be all the top stake nodes and then everyone else. Yeah. And the protocol is desi designed such that you receive this data partially from the network and it's padded with the ratio coding. So if X percentage of the nodes are, you know, malicious or send you bad data or just don't do nothing, um, if that percentage is below the ratio coding, uh, you should be able to recover the full data set. So wow. kind of now this looks like a wireless network, which is like <laughs> <laughs> 12 years of Qualcomm like actually helps here. So go ahead. Is a leader, so I'm assuming leader gets rotated as well, right? So here's the fun part. Now, now things get interesting. <laughs> um, so rotation, right? And, and this really goes into the consensus portion. So imagine we take this timeline um, and we divide it up into slots. Um, and these are, these are just basically counters, right? Um, you know, proof of history counters. So this is you know, 1 million, this is 2 million, whatever. At every point, at every slot, um, there's a single leader that can, belt, that can transmit, mm -hmm. right? So this looks like time division, multiple access, TDMA, one of the earliest wireless protocols. We've effectively taken you know, the rest of time and split it up into slots where any single leader can be the only one that transmits. So what that means is me as a validator, I either receive a transmission from this leader, right? Or potentially, if I fail to reassemble the packets, I generate a virtual tick or a virtual history mm -hmm. because I can derive the history from the last point that I've observed by simply appending like hashes with no data to it, right? So now we have like kind of this protocol where the network either receives the data or fails to receive it, but That's, it doesn't stop. But so let's, let's think from perspective of validator too. Yeah. Um, so I presume those ticks happen rather frequently, right? Yeah. So if if I wait first, like if I wait until I'm confident I didn't receive the data before I start computing hashes. No, you always compute them. Oh, I constantly. So every validator constantly yeah. computes hashes, but then we, we're burning trees again, right? No, just one core per, per node. I see. Yeah. It's less, less, yeah. less of the tree, <laughs> or less trees. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> a cool. significant amount of trees. Right. But, but then <laughs> one, once we get here, now, now we have all the interesting uh, things such as why would I not always pretend that I never received the message? Yeah, that's yeah. So so this is where like things get actually like where you see branching um, is the second leader right is either observed a virtual ledger or a real one and they get to transmit and this is derived either from here or from here mm -hmm. right. So is the third one now then spans this like now this the third one right. But every time like every time there's a new leader a new slot they have um, n number of options to pick from from the previous thing that they've observed. Um, so the branching, you know, kind of starts blowing up here. And how we reduce it is I can kind of show you a different tree. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Right. 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 Every leader, every leader either received the previous leader transmission and says, "Okay, I received the data, I validated it, now I'm going to transmit," or they fail to, and they've right. created a virtual ledger, mm -hmm. and they transmit from that one. That they could have. So there's options where they received one before, one like one month before, et cetera, right? So there's like right, because at any point- How lagging they are. Right, so at any point, right, um, kind of L1. So this one sends data, and L2 gets to decide, well, did I receive the data or did I receive the virtual? Mm -hmm. right. right. So this one goes to T or V, right? T or V. And L3 is over here. Um, so the path here, right, can come from as if L2 failed, L2 failed to observe L1, right? So they chose V. And L3 actually saw, like, you know, also failed to observe L1, L2, and chose T as well. And the only way this is chosen is if both of them fail to observe L1. Does that make sense? Because if L2 transmits data and this, this node observed a failure for a one, and this mm -hmm. data depends on this one, it cannot verify that this is correct, okay. right? So it actually skips it and says, I'm gonna branch, I'm gonna pr prove that I've actually generated enough hashes up to now. And oh, so you're saying what could happen is that L2 did transmit. Yeah. So L2 does not, trans L2 only transmits its own portion. It doesn't transmit the portion from a one. Yeah, correct. And so L3, in theory, might have received L2 without receiving a one, yeah. and still choose to, to skip both of them. Yeah, because it cannot verify them. Makes sense. Right? I mean, it, there is repair happening and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but the idea is that like this node may actually fail to receive both. Mm -hmm. And well, because it failed to receive both, its only option is to assume both have failed, right? Um, and what each node does is whenever they observe you know, transmission data, such that they vote on it, they reset their POH to start running from there. Mm -hmm. um, so at any point, the last thing you voted on, that's your kind of starting point and you start producing hashes. And you could overrun basically everybody else up until it's your turn to transmit. And that could be 10 slots, it could be five slots, it could be zero. And then you transmit that plus all the virtual ticks you, you've generated and you transmit that to the network. So the network, when receiving your data, can actually derive it back to, oh, right, this, this is actually that. came from here, and here's the proof of history that shows that you waited X amount of time. And, and what does the fork choose? So let's say I see L3, and so L3 is sending me uh, skip, skip, transmit, yeah. the proof. Yes. And it's a transmit here. Yeah. But I also see L2 that sent me effectively Transmit V transmit. Yep. Right. But then obviously like like right. L2 so, sent it earlier, right? right? So I observed it in the past. Which one do I choose? Well so, 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 so like when I saw L2 so I now we get to like it. the fun part, for <laughs> selection. Yeah, for um, So imagine you're a validator, right? Um and uh we actually let's go back a little bit to how consensus works to kind of give a, a, a bigger, broader picture. So you have this proof history ledger. Um, and imagine it's just forking, kind of like at a very high level, right? It's just forking all the time. And I have some votes here, right? Every time I vote, each vote um, is for a particular height of the ledger. And this vote starts with a lockout, let's say two. Let's say I vote again. Now this vote is a lockout of two, and this one is a lockout of four, right? So I vote again, this becomes four, this becomes eight, this becomes two. The idea is that every time I vote, um, my votes exponentially stack. The, my lockouts exponentially grow. So this kind of gives us the same behavior as proof of work, right? We're not a PBFT or BFT uh, solution, right? Our, we're availability, so we're using kind of this threshold approach. Um, but the threshold isn't based on um, electricity, right? It's actually based on time. Um, and fundamentally, when you look at it, it's almost like a, a, a trade-off between availability and consistency. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't cheat cap theorem, right? Yeah. <laughs> so literally, you're trading here. What you're saying is, I will drop my availability 
for eight units of time to break this consistency. I see. So a couple questions. Uh, votes, is it, the, the voting is virtual. It's virtual, right? So when, when I'm as a leader, you, every validator, action. when they observe your data, they, they decide vote. to vote on it, and they're voting with a stake. And, and that vote is going to be stored on the on the ledger sometime in the, ledger. the future. In the future, yeah. But so so let's say that so so leaders. So so this mm -hmm. vote, um, you, you know, maybe may have been recorded here. So you actually right. submit submit yeah. information to the next leader that hey, I want to the on. network. So, but but doesn't mean that per block you need to store forty thousand votes. Um, you could compress them with BLS signatures if I you see. wanted to, but so, so we just okay. don't. We don't care about data. We have a we have a solution <laughs> for data. So for all the data you want, yeah, <laughs> because cool. we uh, we are you know our goal is to you know do a hundred thousand transactions per second like steady state. Makes and right sense. now that's two hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. so. Cool. <clears throat> and okay, and so for me to fully understand this logic means that if this vote is recorded. Yeah. And at some point within less, so eight is uh, Ten, units of time. Units of time. So, so without loss of generality, let's yeah. say those millions of hashes, yeah. right? Yeah. So if someone else observes me having a competing vote within less than yes. that period of time, I, like the, there's some exactly. flashing happening? Or yeah. So if this is a vote for this particular branch and you voted here, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get slashed. I see, makes frozen, sense. whatever. Makes right? sense. <clears throat> You're effectively prevented from voting again. Makes sense. <laughs> and so they, for the whole <laughs> slashing, have. yeah, slashing is one is one thing we're looking at. Um, interestingly, all that we need to do is actually just freeze you from like freeze your account, right? From yeah. from getting rewards or from voting. Mm -hmm. It's as effective as slashing uh, in terms of keeping the network steady. No, you can move the money to different account. Um, no, it's like frozen. You can't oh, touch you it can't touch the for like six months, okay. right? So, but then if I voted, let's say I voted thirty times in a row. Right? Yeah, so, exactly. so this that time my lockup is four billion for for all practical purposes. Perfect, exactly. Uh, so that, that, but then let's say your work happened and actually, like this branch was abandoned. When, when was the last time? When was the last time Bitcoin re, uh, reordered thirty two? I, I don't like Bitcoin. Let's use Bitcoin as an example. Right? <laughs> so that was an attack, right? Right. Yeah. So PBFT systems just freeze. I see. Right? For us, two to the thirty two in time units. We can define that as meaning, you know, Infinite. one week. All right, so let's say one week. We it's don't care what it is, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can effectively make a practical decision to say that if a 32 block deep reorg needs to occur, the network should basically do nothing for a week. I because see. <laughs> this should never happen, but if it needs to happen, let's, let's put a human constraint on it, right? I see. And so if some validator. <clears throat> But that is yeah, if it happens that majority of validators ended up on a different fork, but someone yeah. happened to have the thirty blocks, then they sacri like we sacrifice this validator for a week effectively. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, something like that. We the, that's that's something we can effectively decide and even make it a network parameter that the network chooses. And you have some nice finality proofs that say that you know if I saw like sixty four in simulation in it converges really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but they have like a nice written proof in in LaTeX that uh, says that if I saw sixty four blocks, the we have our RFCs is... in GitHub. <laughs> so it's all open source. Cool. Even all the all the awards are open source. So feel free to like. Uh, it's scrutinize it. Scrutinize yeah, scrutinize it. it. File issues. You know, look at the simulation and like. Do you have simulation with adversaries? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so that that's the really interesting part. So imagine like you guys can observe this happening. So can you use like instead? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> when I vote here, um, these lockouts double, mm -hmm. right? So now this is four. This is eight, and this is sixteen. Um, so that means that I can't really vote on any of these branches. And let's say this is a dead branch, right? I have to wait until this point to actually vote. Uh, but let's say a bunch of stuff happened and I actually voted here. Uh, what actually happens is you know, and let's say this lockout actually expired here, right? So this vote is expired too, mm -hmm. right? So the network, you know, you know, AWS had like a, a sneeze and things stopped working. Right? 
Um, and I only ended up voting here. Um, the actual lockouts are like a stack, and this stack is cleared, and now your lockout is two again, and this is still 16. I see. So, but then by the time this is eight, on the next day, the next time I vote, this becomes 32. Only when this is eight. I see. So the way it works is you have a, effectively, you're building a tower. Like I initially called it lock tower because I thought it was a cute cool. name. <laughs> yeah, so if, if this gets white, this starts at two, and then, you and just then that, yeah. right, and then it needs to be two and four, right, and until it's fully rebuilt, you don't actually get to, you know, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that anytime you submit a vote, if this vote is um, at a point that is past any of the lockouts here, you clear the whole stack and you start over, and this allows you to progressively kind of undo your work. So. When you vote here and you commit to a, this branch for 32 lockouts, you're saying that um, I'm going to like, effectively be unavailable for X amount of time to break this consistency, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when that actually happens, um, you remove this vote and you start rebuilding the stack again. Makes Does that sense. make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. And this allows like everybody to enroll. What, what also is interesting is that I can say that at 32 lockout, I want to observe 50% of the network to be at the same branch. And I can make a greedy choice. Like, this is not even network enforced. So you observe, like, by the time you observe 50% already voted on this branch, you will vote? Or? I will, not, I will not double my lockout past 32 on this branch unless I observe 50% plus of oh, the network. Oh, well, in front right. of it. And if I don't observe this, this just gets expired, just yeah. and eventually it gets totally expired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that is like effectively how the nodes in the network can force to be in the same branch. It's because they pick some branch behind, right? Like that's like at an expiration of you know one hour. And they say that they will not commit to a branch on the network unless an hour ago, we see that 50 plus percent of the state pool has committed as well. And the topmost vote, what is the lockout on the topmost vote? Um, it's like, short, so one or two slots. One or two slots, but can I, not, can I not do the following? Can I not vote? Wait for it to expire, vote again, wait for it to expire, so okay. never, never right. build my so, tower. So, so the reward actually comes in, or eight, 16, well, then you have uh, a lot two more. to the 32, right? So when you double again, this is dequeued, and that's your reward. So you actually have to commit. So you actually you actually have to commit to to, like to, build, yeah, to one branch right, for a while. Right. So what, what what this actually means is that we're kind of finalizing this in thirty two blocks. Right. So thirty two blocks ago, we said that this is the final branch, mm -hmm. and this is the thing that matters. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that the network will you yeah. know take a big loss. Yeah. Um, okay. So fifty yeah. So fifty percent of people voted on this. But not all of them, not all of them have like a, lo a large tower, in it, right? right? It's just they voted. So some of them have less to lose, right? But but your threshold would, would be set somewhere here, somewhere in the middle. Oh, so I'm, I'm not going to be just saying if 50% voted, I'm going to be saying 50% right. in this many blocks. Yeah. In the, I, I like this deep right. into this yeah. right. branch. So, so it's like, go, yeah. going back to this, right? What I can do is I can actually withhold my vote and observe both L2, right? So I can observe both of these. Mm -hmm. We can't. We can't. There's no way for us to stop nodes from doing this. But L2 is not the leader here, right? No, L2 was the leader, right? They well, transmitted this branch, branch. Yeah. right? Two. So, so, so I, I'm more interested in the case where. So let's say. So let's say L2 was the leader at this slot. Yeah. All right. So this is the. And L3 the had a faster ASIC and overhead. Oh no. So let's say this is time, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So L3 published it here, and yeah. nothing was published here. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I as L four will I always choose the the one that was published so, later because like big, big, let's big, say L three is complete. So the greedy yeah. choice uh, that we want the network to make mm -hmm. is to if they have multiple branches, mm -hmm. right? It should be unlikely because we're using this force delay, mm -hmm. right? To actually have L three generate X amount of data before they transmit, but they can cheat. They can use a faster ASIC, or this one could just be slower, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when you actually observe two branches, you should pick the one that maximizes the network reward. So maximizes the lockup. I see. So you can, because you can examine both branches, you can compute all the votes, and you can say that you know branch one is the one that actually 
has, has, yeah, yeah. has the most lockout. But isn't it counterintuitive? The higher the network reward is, the more inflated the Solana token, the less <laughs> value is of my, <laughs> of my of person, yeah, personal But the leader. more committed, uh, the more there is finite, you know, you can, oh, yeah. given these lockouts, you can actually very easily compute economic finality. Makes sense. Right, and the more economic finality there is in a branch, that's the branch that you want to be a part of because that's the one where you actually get a reward. All the other I see. ones die, right? I see. Well, it's, it's not sort of immediately obvious to me that, right. like, I would multiply economic finality by how much the, so, the token is diluted, right? Yeah. And but, it sort of sounds like economic yeah. finality. Pre presumably, the dilution will be so small it's compared yeah. to the reward you'll yeah. get. Right. Like the it's, like proof of work. it's like a proof of work, right? Every block dilutes Bitcoin. But you don't want to mine a, bunch a fork that is not going to be accepted into the main tree because you're yeah. wasting electricity, right? Mm -hmm. So similarly here, you want to commit to a fork that has the most economic finality because that's the one that's most likely to survive. Because really for us, lockout is economic finality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you compute economic finality, do you just count those guys who just dropped beyond two to the 30th second? Or are you also like trying to predict how much people will get in the future? The way it's written right now is it just basically adds up all the lockouts on the branches and then picks the one. So that's yeah, kind of rough sense. approximation. But then but then consider, so let's say everybody has, the speed of ASICs is the same for everybody. Yeah. Right, and so this is time, like the second zero, uh, on the second zero, one of the uh, one of the leaders transmitted, right? And so yeah. three absorbed it and L2. Uh, but let's say L2 actually didn't see yeah. right? Uh, and then on second one, let, let's say it's once per yeah. second, uh, neither of them, well, actually, let's say L2 did observe something. Yeah. On second two, L2 did observe something, and that continues for a while. Right, so L3 has only one block it observed, and it could be produced by L3 itself and never, right. and never distributed, right? But L2 has been building for a while. Yeah. And then at some point, L3 publishes a transmit message. Yeah. Again. So this one would be effectively dropped by the network because everyone that saw this T's have voted. So right. the majority of the network that observed the data has voted. And when they observe this, that doesn't include these votes, they can't actually vote. Oh, because vote. they've been voting. Yeah. And they're blocked out, right? Because now if I've observed three, three data transmissions, my lockout is somewhere here, right? So this guy is effectively like makes sense. This is this is basically the packet loss. Yeah, because so my point was that, that like this T is twice as important as any of this, but you, but because there are many T's there. Right. So because this leader didn't observe this T, they didn't vote on it. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's whatever the probability whatever the majority of the network has observed. Right. If the next leader is also in that majority, then it mm -hmm. kind of continues. But, but if this guy is like voted like for this and L3 included all those votes in the first T and L2 like he didn't so, observe it. So intuitively think of it this way, right? I have some probability of success, right? Mm -hmm. And the next leader has some, you know, other probability of success. Um, if all of these are in the majority, then you continue kind of stacking votes. But as soon as somebody's in the you know, minority, you know, fail, um, this node fails, right? And the network has X amount of time to kind of get back to the majority state. And another question. So, um, <clears throat> does that make sense? Every time, like, every time we rotate, there's some probability that you've observed the data, mm -hmm. right? right? And there's some probability that you're in the majority group. And as long as that's true and continues to be true, we kind of keep running, keep going forward. Otherwise, so so let, let, let's say in the in the chain that I observe, uh, the first leader transmitted the message, yeah, and the second leader says, "Let me say, how how, do, how does V even appear?" The second the, uh, the second leader is producing its own POH from the last vote that they've taken. From the last vote, yeah, so, so, so when they transmit, they also prove that they see and see five transmissions. Oh, I see. So let's, uh, let's say. So, uh, so TV effectively means that I, so let's say I'm a leader, I saw this transmission, which is, so, yeah, so I'm leader P, for example, right? right? Exactly. I saw transmission from leader one, yeah. and then I didn't say anything from leader two. Yeah. Do people vote on this V? No, they don't. No, that's, okay. that's, that's so virtual. Virtual. votes only accumulate when something is actually transmitted. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause so these are virtual, right? Yeah, I mean, but they have no data and they can be derived from any point in the yeah. state. So, so in my hypothetical example, this thing has like one vote, which was never doubled because nobody, yeah. Exactly. Voting on it. While here, this message, even though it was published later, yeah. by this time has 
you uh, mean? Multiple people having dates. Yeah. I see. Yeah, <clears throat> so, so like, usually the chain which has more transmissions will be chosen, in fact. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this this kind of saves us in the case where somebody is like built an asynchronous circuit and they're like, you know, basement lab, basement fab, <laughs> and they're like. You know, generate a just bunch overran of leads, a right? Bunch overran of and then do a T here. Um, one, because this will pop a bunch of rewards, so it'll have mm -hmm. lower economic finality. And two, right? Uh, like th that's exactly kind of how. No, nobody can load yeah, that. Yeah. But it, it's possible to have like a like if you have some portion of the stake, you can like flip the thing, right? Like what, what is the portion of the state that you need to- So like, this, is this, this is like a- To get to, like, to vote on this. This, this. this is like an actual censorship attack, yeah. right? Um, so if you're L4 and you're some portion of the stake, um, you can potentially just overrun the previous leader every time. Yeah. Um, so you do a transmission here. That, and then you that ignore kill, everybody. Yeah, that, that kills whatever this node yeah. is, right? Um, so and if you're clever, I mean, you would include all the validator messages except the ones you want to censor. Mm -hmm. And this should be the majority network. So this is like the, the actual censorship attack. Uh, the only way we fight that is the VDFs will progressively approach whatever secret VDF you can build in speed. So, you know, the difference between V0 and V1 might be 2x, but between <laughs> V1 and V2 is going to be 50%, between V3 and V4, 5%. That's fine. But so, what, like right now, for example, let's say everybody has the same homogeneous hardware. What is the portion of the stake to you need if you let's let's say you have two leaders right now, right? Um, so the rotation is stake weighted. Is stake weighted. Um, yeah. So we uh, the active set right is computed from the network. So whatever it is. We compute this, and then we decide this is the new schedule, mm -hmm. and you just rotate all the leaders. And even if you're, you know, low stake node with crappy hardware, the only thing that happens is a packet loss. So our goal is to make these slots as fast as possible. In theory, it could be 100 milliseconds because this node could have pre-computed all the data right before their slot and started transmitting, right? Still um, takes like two hundred milliseconds to yeah. get to China, but <laughs> you can you can pipeline it, um, right? So the so when it goes to China, right, they might actually be if, if Off that a little bit. right if if they're in the minority state group, they'll just get kind of censored out potentially. <laughs> <laughs> so we're censoring China now, right? It's, it's, <laughs> but it's permissionless, right? We can't yeah, yeah, really, like. I I I think it's gonna be bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so let's imagine an example where you have uh, a, a one, one account that has 20% of stake, right? So they would appear 20% like, of the time, yeah. one-fifth of the time. One-fifth of the time, and then they also have 20% of all the votes. So can they pretty much do, like, transmit, you know, ignore, ignore, transmit, and they add, like, 20% of their votes in this branch. So can they censor, like, the rest of the... No, because if, if the rest of the network is observing this, which includes this, then they're, one, they can't choose this unless, I mean, this node can choose this, right? But effectively, everybody, everybody else can't choose this branch but because like, they've already voted. But like, others, felt like, I mean, let, let's imagine, you know, before that, they all are in the same branch, right? Right. So there will be folks that have voted for this as well. Right. So you accumulate all that and you're on 20%. But they course. would have to skip. Right. Yeah. Those folks would have to actually actively participate in this. If they voted on this, they they cannot move that that vote over. Yeah, they cannot move them over. So they're locked out, right? From from their perspective, this transmission is is a failure because it doesn't include their previous vote. So it's a it's a separate for mm -hmm. So they can't they can't switch over until this expires, right? So yeah, but. They would have to effectively, you can bribe them and tell them, hey, you know, don't vote. Don't vote here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'll pay for your rewards. Well, well, like, I mean, yeah, so just don't vote at all. Like, right. Plus, vote okay. in a little bit. But you can just, you don't even have to do that. You can just tell them that, and if people agree, then. <laughs> 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 That's the point. <laughs> um, 
the main thing, so what's interesting is in our simulation, um, if you have all the vote, all the nodes uh, instead, uh, instead of picking the, the branch with the most reward, pick the branch with the least reward. But still uh, not allow, like, let's say, I think, was it 256? Not allow this lockout to be under 50% of the network. Mm -hmm. Right? So p nodes that just want to disrupt the network. Um, they can't actually vote on branches that die because then they just lock themselves out from the network, right? So the, the thing that they choose is to continue voting in a branch that becomes the main trunk. Um, but always pick out of multiple branches uh, the worst one, the one that has the least amount of economic finality. Um, this network still moves forward, just at about like with everybody being parasitic, it moves forward at about like 10% of the rate. So that is really cool. That means that uh, if the hardware is actually you know uni uniform, right, um, we can actually run this thing to be fairly uh, censorship resistant and fairly kind of attack resistant to parasitic nodes. That's like if everybody's parasitic branches. So. Yeah. It still moves forward, yeah, which yeah. is cool, right? Yeah, that's good. Versus like Bitcoin, if everybody's voting, uh, you know, if everybody's just choosing their own branch, right, yeah, just like, it uh, actually doesn't move forward. So I have a couple, uh, one, one short yeah. question is, you need randomness, right? What is the... No, we don't use randomness. Oh, so how the how leaders selected? Like, how is the order of leaders? Randomness is hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to build a random source that is actually secure. Unless you have a VDF. Um, you do. <laughs> so we do, but again, like our VDF is biased because every time we submit a message, that creates a bias. So you could, in theory, like what would be easy for us to provide is... Um, so, right, you have like... You know, T T, but you're also everybody's computing these virtual branches from the last transmission. What you can do is use this random value based on this for this block. That sounds like a terrific idea. <laughs> it's a little weak because anyone with just an ASIC that's too twice yeah, as fast. Right. Oh, they can predict the random values. Right. I see. So you need you need like many VDs pretty much. Yeah, but that doesn't work because then everybody has to run like thirty two cores worth of VDFs, and that that is problematic. So for us, uh, we don't use randomness. What we actually use is just the the number, the number of counts, the height, as the seed to like seed a random to to just scramble those active set. I see. So it's really just round robin with a little bit of reordering. I see. But like the person, if I have ten x more stake than you, am I going to be? You uh, can actually like buy by a split, splitting splitting the accounts, no? Uh, every time this is rotated over a long time, you will be right because this is random enough. It's just predictable. Hopefully, Unbi okay. it's totally predictable but unbiasable. I see. Wait, but you said the number of accounts. So let's no, the number, the height. So this is like you know height one hundred million, and this is height oh, two hundred okay. million. That's the seed to like uh, but, some some random. So, but but if this is the seed, can I not? Like you know in advance everybody that's going to be scheduled for the rest of the time. You know in advance everybody who's going to be scheduled. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody's participating? Always. Regarding their decision, the, like they don't decide if they want to participate or not? Uh, the, when they stake, right? There's an active side. Yeah, so, so you can decide not to stake if you know, like yeah. you can pretty much decide to stake yeah. or not, just split your account and... Yeah. So, so, so let's say... Let's say you don't have, I mean, you don't have to stake, but everybody that's staked um, that wants to be in the rotation says that they're. But, in the but let's say that in practice, let's say in practice, ninety-nine percent of people are just the same who, who maintain the network, right? Because yeah. it seems like if you already let's call it mining, if you're already mining, it doesn't make sense to stop mining, and if you're not mining yet, like presumably not that many people will be onboarding, especially when the network is yeah. sufficiently uh, operational. Yeah. Operational, then it feels like what I can do is I can start. You can, I can create one million accounts and then start using combinations of, the, of those accounts to see how introducing those into the set of validators yeah, to influence the order. Right. And so then once I find that good one, I just move my assets in there. So just to make this practical, this is computed over like two weeks. Right. Okay. So I, right. I, I, need, to be, I need to rely on the fact that within two weeks, nobody else. Right. And also your staking yeah. requires like two weeks warm up, two weeks cool down. 
Yeah. You know, we, we just stick human timeouts there. <laughs> and that's it. This is suspiciously similar to threshold proof of speed. That is pretty much what we use. That's yes. practically <laughs> what we use for what? For big machine. For, for our, yeah, for okay. our staking mechanism. Cool. It's all the same. <laughs> Everybody's like, you know, we're all circling the same, same idea, ideas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not <cool>. the train. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the second question is, uh, so the 40,000 nodes you drew before on the tree, each of them has a GPU, right, effectively, because each of them needs to validate. Now, let's say I'm a point of sale terminal. Yes. What sort of, what, like, oh, fin, other fin like clients? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the complicated part. Um, so, this is where Justin's magic VDF that has <laughs> asymptotic verification would be great, would, would be, be great. really useful. But because that's not ready, um, the way we're doing this is your validation message can point to the previous validation set, right? So what you as a thin client, uh, in fact, this is what we're doing for um, kind of our, our like signing enclave. You can observe that X amount of, you know, you start with some set of validators, right? As you trusted validators, like you've observed the network, you've done at a, at a station, right? You're, this is my set of, set of validators. Um, you can observe sets in the future of votes that simply point back. So now you know that like these guys are derived from the trusted set because they're a subset of this. And they voted on the branch that you care about. So, so you're not validating the hashes per se or the history. You just, just trust the set, set of validators yeah. to maintain um, it for you. This is weaker, definitely weaker than validating the, the time. Um, the problem here too is um, what you, <laughs> what you need to do is like actual transaction validation, right? Like I sent you a transaction and you want to quickly verify it. And this appears somewhere here in the middle of all these, of all of all these, the hashes, yeah. all the hashes. Um, so what we need to do is actually point this back up here through like a Merkle tree. Oh, by the way, is transaction, transaction in the history, is it just a confirmation that it was, it was received or that's a confirmation that this is valid as of this point? This is valid. As this is valid. Okay, so transaction is only included if it's validated. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So is your, you have an account model or do you take so? Uh, we have an account model. You can actually, I mean, you can, in theory, have a, tr you can submit a transaction that pays out to two different accounts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Well, I mean, account model will also do everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like then for account model, do you include then, do you include a transaction and a new Merkle root pretty much after this transaction is applied? We just don't allow them to be in if they fail. Yeah, yeah but uh, when I'm when because I'm, if you if if this is just a payment, you can do that. But for a smart contract, you would need to do at, you would have to like print out the state, yeah. right? Uh, so and that's you, like a much more complicated model. But if I just join the network, so to you start validating. I need to like rerun it, all of the transactions from the beginning of time. As, like, I mean, These validation messages include uh, effectively the signature of the account state. I see, okay. Right, so you can look at the network and see, you know, everybody's everybody's stake is voting for these signatures. Go give me a checkpoint. And, and that's like a Merkle root. Yeah, yeah. So voting is pretty much. No, yeah, Merkle. it is. <laughs> 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 and then, so so when on when I'm recomputing the hashes on the GPU, right? So every now and then, so so let's say I'm computing. So let's say. Like I was the leader and I was like, this is my hash one. Yeah. And then the SHA of hash one is my hash two. Yeah. And then the SHA of hash yeah. two is yeah. my hash three. Yeah. But then for hash four, I also have some transaction. Yeah. Right. And so this is my yeah. hash four. Um, so, so the ledger output this is, is... This is also running on GPU, right? So GPU has this like branch which says if it has a transaction. The data that you're like submitting to the GPU is just kind hash, of like this, hash, you know, just hashes. Hashes of transactions. Yeah. Right? But this is like a big blob of data, and we hash that. I see. Right, and then we submit the hash into here. Oh, so if there's no transaction, then it's like a zero. Yeah. There's some sort of hash. There's some sort of value there as well. I see. I see. So, so do you do it for each one? So you have like, like H one zero, um, like every time, for a million times, or are you just. So we don't have, we don't store the zeros. Oh, you just like <laughs> ignore the zeros. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah, we don't store the zeros in chain. Uh, the ledger data structure just contains the, you know, effectively number of counts, number of hashes, number of POH hashes, the yeah. 
the current hash, and then an optional hash of the blob. The hash of the blob at the specific. At this count. So oh, when, you're, see, when you're replaying this, you just simply stick it in there. Yeah. But you also have, you know, the transactions attached to this data structure. Yeah. For this specific stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then how, how many do you have? Like, pretty much the question is. So blob is two k. Uh, sorry, sixty four kilobytes. Um, depends on the transaction size because mm -hmm. they're smart contracts. They're variable. Yeah. Um, right now, our maximum is five hundred twelve bytes. But like a simple move. Um, the smallest one we can come up with is like 176 bytes. Per transaction? Per transaction? For just a one, like one, uh, you know, uni, uni payment. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying to compute how, how, how much bandwidth do you need to GPU to verify all that? Uh, like modern day GPUs have 16 gigabits per second bandwidth. This is from, this, CPU, from the. Uh, yeah, PCI 3 is uh, one gigabit per lane. You have 16 lanes. Yeah. But you don't need to send the actual transaction, you're just sending the hash. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, so well, hash, we actually, need to hash that first. You actually, we actually do send the whole transaction data because you can't do that many signatures per second on the CPUs. I see. So we. Oh, you verify signatures there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's our um, our defense against you know, DDoS <laughs> is just <laughs> verifying signatures, you know, many more signatures per second than the network can actually transmit. Well. That won't stop like a, a router attack, right? Like a, if everybody's flooding like yeah, some yeah, upstream yeah. component, yeah. but at, at each node we can actually <laughs> verify way more signatures per second than <laughs> yeah, you can transmit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, presumably you can yeah flood the network from many nodes into yeah. Okay. Shall we wrap up here? Is there any other parts you want um, to mention, like for smart contracts? To yeah, that is a, a totally fun problem <laughs> itself. Um, because so our contracts, you know, what is a transaction for us? Um, transaction is, um, well, first of all, uh, running like the, the actual like bottleneck in computation isn't CPU, it's memory, right? Like the, the problem with making things go fast is just memory pipelining through the system. Like if you look at just operating systems and how processes run, like what you're dealing with is memory throughput, like caches, like all this other stuff. Um, so how do we make this fast? Um, is every transaction specifies a bunch of public keys. And these keys are pointers to accounts, right? Mm -hmm. And these accounts have some data associated with them. And you can think of it as user data, right? But the way I think of it is we have an a operating system with a single address space. It just happens to be the size of public keys, right? So 256-bit address space. Uh, but or, but uh, also uh, memory protection. So these accounts are assigned to a process. Right? Mm -hmm. By process, I mean, you know, there's some account here whose data contains program code. And this code is just code, it has no state. So this program code is a state transition function over these accounts. And the accounts that are assigned to this, um, this is the only code that can modify the data. So. Whenever you do an assignment, the status bits are zero, and this code is the only thing that can flip those bits, right? So every time you submit a transaction, it does some bit flipping here. Um, so what else it can do is it can move tokens around, you know, however it wants, um, and it can also pay out tokens to external to external accounts. Yeah. But this is done outside of this code, right? It no, this code does this modification, and then. When we, you know, this this actual program could run on GPUs, right? Our bytecode is like, is like very very simple. It's called Berkeley Packet Filter. It's designed for porting into any architecture you want. So we can actually port it to Spear Five. So we can execute all these programs on GPUs, 
And then so I'm just pay Jared this data first into yeah. the view. Yeah, go fetch it, go run all the stuff in parallel, get the modifications back. And the only thing we're validating is that if the data's been modified, that it was done by this program, right? And if there's tokens that have been moved around, that tokens going out were moved, you know, that this program didn't spend any external tokens and that uh, the total sum of tokens is the same. But the tokens here are meaning native tokens. Yeah, but the actual thing that pays for CPU yeah. and storage and whatever. So if you're do if you're for example moving some other like Yeah, that's just data modification, yeah, that's yeah. state that's so big. We don't we don't really know what that is. <laughs> but because we effectively every transaction effectively specifies all the memory regions it needs to access, mm -hmm. uh, we can schedule yeah, all the non overlapping ones. Yeah. Yeah. And what languages compile to that bytecode? It's a LLVM backend, so anything from LLVM. The backend is is kind of weak. It, it's a little weak. Doesn't support like all the features yet, but that's just uh, it's just work. Just how so you, if you have any so you, LLVM code to GPU, um, why why are we still writing CUDA? <laughs> No, you can. Uh, you, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's I'm pretty, pretty sure it right uses LVM. Yeah, yeah. The problem isn't that. It's that uh, we have a, a bytecode that is uh, very stable, right? This is a very stable bytecode yeah, yeah, that's yeah. going to be unchained forever. Yeah. And we can port it to whatever architecture happens to be the fastest mm -hmm. one. It may be for some use cases that Spear 5 is the fastest thing, but for others, it's not, like x86. So we want to really keep it in this very simple to manage intermediate state. So right now, but you execute all these programs on GPU, even though maybe some of them may be way more efficient on CPU you um, as a CS correction. Right now, it's all CPU based. Oh, it's all CPU based. Yeah, so do you guys want to write some JIT to Spear 5? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we you, can, you can use the, the, the engine in your blockchain, in your <laughs> chain. Yeah. So well, what's awesome about like using a GPU for a contract execution is if you have a spike like CryptoKitties, yeah. right? Um, the same program code can execute many, many, many different transactions at the same time on the GPU because you have this like massive parallel, massive amounts of lanes for the same code. So if you had a CryptoKitties like spike, you actually don't use a different thread per transaction. You use one thread that goes over this enormously wide lane. Yeah, and then you parallel is good everything yeah. else. So that that is like the really awesome thing. But you can do that on CPU too, right? You just schedule um, things based on data access, right? Not with CPU threads, because uh, you have to use like vectorized code. So like something like uh, AVX. Mm -hmm. But the AVX pipeline is like really, really limited for massive parallelization compared to a GPU one. Right. So in theory, right, the cost to execute like a more popular program should actually be lower for the network. We can still pre cache them. Yep. Like you don't need to page. Yeah. And time. right, and you're effectively just reusing uh, these lanes. We'll see if that pays out in practice. It's <laughs> yet to be measured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it looks like it, it'll work in theory. But but this is done on like hundred in your case hundred millisecond increments, right? So presumably like No, like so you have a bunch of transactions, they're all for CryptoKitties, right? Yeah. There's but, one contract that's the CryptoKitties contract. But I'm a leader for hundred milliseconds, right? So I collect some transactions, execute them, stick yeah. it in and like I don't yeah. need to do it anymore. So But if I will But if out. that's like the if that's the popular transaction that's being thrown it's, it's at the network, like there all the time, you can leave this program in the, in cache, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know that, like, hey, everybody's flooding the network with these CryptoKitties transactions, right? Yeah. All right, cool. Those are like levels of optimization that I don't know if we need yet, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're fun fun to worry about. So, so let's finish with a few non technical questions. When when is the mainnet? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's the hardest question. So uh, our goal is to be FC, uh, effectively kind of end of January. And then uh, mainnet will be driven, I think, by maybe more legal side in the US. Mm -hmm. Awesome.
Cool. Okay, let's wrap up here. Yeah. Thanks okay. a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, yeah. having us. Yeah. <laughs> Asking fun. questions. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Great. Great. Yeah. yeah. Feel free to ask questions on YouTube and yeah, yeah. We'll follow up from there. Okay. Bye. Cool.